affect financial market outcomes. Uh, she received her PhD in managerial economics from Northwestern uh, and her BA in economics from ITAM. In between, she worked at uh, uh, the Mexican Central Bank uh, for three years uh, with the Ritter Financial Service Group. Um, Paulina works on very original and relevant questions. Uh, in recent work, Paulina, with her co-authors, look at the direct link between the stocks people buy and the products they purchase. Before this work, at least to, to my knowledge, uh, the idea was that investment affects consumption only through their effect on wealth. In this very original project, they use data from a fintech app that opens a brokerage account for its users and rewards them with the stocks when they stop a, a previously elected stores. They do find that ownership of a specific stocks triggers feelings of loyalty that lead individuals to consume more from those brands, complementing previous findings that individuals also invest in brands they know and like. Uh, so when you talk with someone, if you want for them to get to know you better, you should tell them about your stocks, <laughs> the stocks that you have. <laughs> and, uh, but again, it's a, a very interesting project. Uh, she will present today, uh, do saving nudges cost borrowing evidence from a, a mega study. Um, as usual, uh, you can interrupt with questions, comments, and suggestions during the presentation. So thank you so much again, Paulina, uh, for being with us. Thank you so much, uh, Julio, for the introduction. And thank you uh, for inviting me to present at this seminar. You guys are, are doing a lot of interesting stuff um, with everyone who's working in um, with data and questions relevant to Latin America. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Julio mentioned in this project, I'm going to, in this presentation, I'm gonna present the results of a project in which we study whether saving nudges have a potential or intended consequence of leading to increases in credit card debt. And in particular, we're gonna do that um, using an experiment that involved 3 million individuals of a large bank in Mexico. This is joint work with Micaela Pagel at Columbia. So let me start by pointing out, pointing out that not just a policy tool of growing popularity. And in particular, there are a number of policies currently in, play, currently in place that are encouraging individuals to save more using nudges. However, due to data limitations or uh, design features, this, a lot of papers that evaluate the effect of nudges focus specifically on the target outcome of interest. When it comes to saving nudges, they focus on whether saving nudges lead to increases in savings without looking at where the money came from. And that's an important question because all these policies are based on the implicit assumption that savings are financed with decreases in consumption and not with increases in debt for some potentially high interest credit instrument. So in this paper, we're gonna to speak to this question precisely by asking if saving not just cost borrowing, we think this has direct policy relevance, in particular, when we note that there's a large fraction of the population that simultaneously hold high interest credit and low interest savings, given rise to what it's called the credit card debt puzzle that has been the center of attention of a lot of people doing research in this space. In particular, what we're gonna do is that, as I mentioned, we are going to look at the result of this large scale field experiment in which 3.1 million clients of a large bank in Mexico were encouraged to save. The main level for the analysis are going to be, for the experiment are going to be SMS messages, which are the simplest and the less intrusive if you want of all nudges. And we're going to complement that with a rich panel data that is going to capture a lot of information about the financial lives of these individuals. In particular, we're going to have access to credit card data, to checking account data, 
including ATM transactions and spending by category. But in particular, we're going to have access to something that other people that have tried to look at a similar question have not been able to get access to, which is rollover debt. And what do I mean by rollover debt? It's important to make a distinction when it comes to credit cards between credit card balances and credit card debt. Credit card balances can very well be paid off at the end of the billing cycle. And credit card balances do not need to accrue interest because credit cards are also a payment method. So there can be individuals that constantly use their credit card. That doesn't mean that they are borrowing. No? But when they do borrow, interest rates tend to be high. And this distinction is important if we want to evaluate the impact of saving not just in borrowing outcomes. And what happens is that credit card balances are a lot more available than credit card interest charges or rollover debt. In particular, credit bureau data, that is the, um, that is the data that has been used in the past to study, to preliminary look if there's any interaction between saving and borrowing. Um, but credit bureau data does not contain any information about interest rates or the cost of credit. Credit bureau data only includes information on credit card balances. And when you think about it, one can realize that credit card balances could even be negatively correlated with credit card debt. Because credit card balances can go up and down, but what is going to determine your credit card debt has to do with how much you pay back every month. So we think that rollover debt that's going to be approximated by a credit card interest charges. It's a much more precise measure of credit card borrowing than credit card debt and credit card balances themselves. And in addition to observing credit card interest and rollover debt, we are also able to see spending data, as I mentioned. And because of that, we're going to be able to go beyond just a simple initial evaluation into what is the impact of saving nudges on saving and on actual borrowing, but we can go one step further and see how can we explain those changes in the balance sheet of individuals. And we're gonna do that by looking at how they spend, how their spending patterns change when they start saving more as a result of the nudge. In doing so, as we look at this interaction between saving and borrowing decision, we're going to provide some new facts about this phenomenon that I described earlier that has been puzzling for some time, which is the idea that individuals hold high interest credit and low interest savings simultaneously. And we're gonna do that, paying particular attention to treatment effect heterogeneity. We're going to study, we're going to take treatment of heterogeneity very seriously, and we're going to be applying some of these methods for machine learning, of machine learning for causal inference that had been growing in popularity. So to give you a sense of what we find, first, we think that the question of whether saving not just lead to increases in borrowing is particularly relevant for those who respond a strong, uh, in a strong fashion to the treatment. If I nod you to save and you don't save, it's not so surprising if you don't increase your credit card debt. But if I nod you to save and you actually save a lot, that's when the question is relevant, where is the money coming from? So I wanna pay particular attention to individuals for whose observable characteristics predict a large treatment effect. And this is a moment when maybe some of you may be worried that um, that we're gonna be picking and choosing individuals that have a large response to the treatment, and that could be just noise. Maybe we're just picking up a spuriously large effect because there may be some observable that lead uh, to a particularly large treatment effect on a particular subpopulation, and that idiosyncratic shock that made them save more could actually make them borrow less as well. So, the method that we're going to use is going to allow us to say, well, don't worry, or at least don't worry about that, because this concern that I just described, that just by chance we're going to be picking up noise that looks like a spuriously large treatment effects, if we compare the treatment effect in multiple subpopulations, that's not what we're going to do, no? We're, instead, we're going to use a causal forest 
that is precisely designed to study treatment effect heterogeneity to identify individuals with the largest predicted treatment effect without the fear that we will just be subject to overfitting bias or without the fear that we will just be picking up noise, idiosyncratic noise that looks like um, large treatment effects, but in reality is just noise or like a spuriously large treatment effect. So using the causal forest is gonna allow us to identify individuals with the largest predicted treatment effect to zoom in the analysis and focus on them without the fear of being picking up spuriously large treatment effects that in reality are just knows. Charles, you have a question? Yeah, I did have a question, but I mean, I'll, I'll wait to see how much you describe later on before asking some of them. But one of them was, um, I, I guess you're gonna talk about this, but while you're describing it, are, are so in some contexts in Latin America, People can go, they can default on their debt and they can just go to another bank. And there's not like a, there's not like a credit score. There's no implication to defaulting on their debt at one bank and then going to another bank and getting credit because they're just not good tracking of credit scores or credit behavior. Is that true here? Um, in general, no. While we don't focus our analysis in credit bureau data because we want to focus on credit card interest, we do have access to credit bureau data. And we look at what is the impact on uh, credit card balances and in other features of the portfolio that is tracked in the credit bureau. So in particular, there is a well-functioning credit bureau that it's gonna be tracking your balances and your performance across, uh, across all banks, no? And across multiple credit products. Okay, all right, thanks. Good. Yes. Yeah, one question is, so are you going to look uh, at the mechanism? So uh, what is, uh, or what are the potential explanations? So for example, this has to do with mental accounting or what Jared was mentioning that people is, uh, basically they take it there because they are not planning to pay. Uh, yeah. Excellent, Julio. So, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, first, just to kind of like cut the story short and cut the suspense, we're going to find that there are no increases in borrowing, but we are going to find that there is some um, exacerbation of the co-holding puzzle because people that were carrying credit card debt respond to the saving nudge. They save more and they don't use the money to pay off their debt. So, that phenomenon, we are going to spend some time trying to figure out why is that happening? And yes, mental accounting is going to be one of our um, main uh, candidates and explanations. And those are the what I refer to as we provide some facts about the co-holding puzzle, and we interpret those flat facts through the lenses of different explanations that exist in the literature for this uh, credit card debt puzzle or co-holding puzzle. So I, I am gonna get to that. And yes, that is gonna be a very interesting part of the discussion. Thank you. Of course. But before we get to that, just let me spend a little bit of time and telling you what we actually do and how we do it, no? Because um, as I mentioned, we wanna focus on those individuals that uh, are more likely to respond strongly to the treatment. And we're gonna do that with this causal forest. And I just wanna emphasize one feature of this causal forest that in my opinion, it's really useful, um, which is that the causal forest allows us to recover individual level predictions of treatment effects. Just to make, make sure that the, the idea is clear. So the fundamental problem of causal inference is that we only observe each individual in the treatment or in the control group. So to get around that problem, what we do is that we define groups of individuals in the treatment and groups of individuals in the control and we take averages. So we only observe treatment effects at the group level. We never observe treatment effects at the individual level. But what this methodology does is that it's gonna use a lot of observable characteristics to give me a prediction at the individual level. Given your covariates, how do people with your particular combination of covariates would respond to the treatment? So because we get to have this individual level prediction, we can literally flag 
individuals that are in the top quartile of the predicted treatment effect distribution. So I am going to have a distribution of predicted treatment effects, and I'm just going to take the top 25% individuals that are most likely to respond to the treatment. And I'm going to focus a lot of the analysis on them. And I'm gonna do that because the question of whether saving nudges lead to increases in borrowing is particularly relevant for those that respond strongly to the treatment. Oh, there we go. We select individuals in the top quartile. And then for those individuals that are the most likely to respond to the treatment, we ask whether, first of all, is there an increase in savings? And yes, we find a strong increase in savings that tell us that this method is actually working, no? And we ask whether this increase in saving is accompanied by increases in borrowing and or by changes in spending or credit card repayment behavior. Okay, um, so just to give you a sense of what we found, we found that for these individuals that respond stronger to the treatment, there is an increase of 6% in savings that leads to a 2,000 Mexican pesos increase in savings. So what is 2,000 Mexican pesos? If we want to adjust for power purchase parity, roughly the very rough approximation just divide by 10. So we're talking about almost $200 increases in savings out of this SMS message. We send individuals SMS messages and they increase their savings by more than, by almost, uh, by a little over $200 PPP adjusted. So then we look at our main question, no? where did the money come from? Just a quick question. Yes. Um, so that's like um, 2,000 pesos in, in what time period, like per, per month or? Uh, yes. So this, is, this was over a seven week period the average daily balances was two was two thousand uh, Mexican pesos higher. Okay, thanks. Um, so we then we look where did the money come from, no? Um, and we do not find. We look at this measure of rollover debt that is based on credit card interest, um, and we do not find significant effects. And we care a lot about the precision of that estimate, right? Because that is the central part of our question. So we can actually build confident intervals, no? And uh, we can rule out increases of more, the coefficient actually turns out to be negative as I'm gonna show you. And um, if I build the confidence intervals and then divide the, the, the upper confidence interval by the increases in savings that I observe, we can see that for every dollar in savings, we can rule out a one cent increase in borrowing cost with 95% uh, confidence. So we interpret this as evidence that, that no saving nudges do not lead to increases in credit card borrowing. So then where does the money come from? We actually look at how people are spending on their credit cards and on their debit cards and on the um, and on their ATM withdrawals, and we see that people are spending less, as measured by these different by these different variables, which suggests to us that indeed that assumption that's at center of margins is it's well funded, no. But then we pay particular attention, as I was telling Julio earlier, to individuals that were carrying credit card debt before the intervention. So we have people that are before the intervention were not paying their credit card balances in full, and they nevertheless respond to the treatment. So what does that mean? These individuals that were paying credit card balance in full, in, uh, that were paying credit card interest, I'm sorry, at baseline, they have a positive and significant response to the treatment. We find a 5.6% increase in saving, increase in savings. As a percentage, this number is very similar to the number that I showed you before. So as a percentage, these individuals were actually responding as strongly as those that were not carrying credit card interest. 
And uh, the base for these savings is slightly lower. So yes, the increase in savings is a bit, a bit smaller. But nevertheless, remember this very coarse approximation of dividing by 10 to get a PPP dollars, we, we see that it's over $100 that individuals that were carrying credit card debt at baseline increase their savings by $100 after receive PPP after receiving um, these not just to save. Sorry, is this still amongst the, um, the sample? The sample that has a highest predicted likelihood of responding to the nudge? That's correct. Okay. Um, um, but, but again, for them, there is no increase in credit card interest. So just to, to, to make sure that we're clear into what happened, they are paying credit card interest. They are not paying their credit card balances in full. No, they get these messages. They save, they leave more money on their checking account, but they don't borrow more. These guys also decrease their consumption, but the problem for them is that they do not use these new savings. They don't use them to pay off existing debt because we actually can measure that as well. And we do that, no? Um, what, did you use these savings to, how does repayment, credit card repayment change following this intervention? do we see an increase in the money that is paid back towards credit cards? And, and no, there are, this money is not used to pay off uh, existing debt. So in a way, these saving nudges, even though they didn't lead to increases in debt, they exacerbated the co-holding puzzle. They exacerbated the credit card debt puzzle because we have individuals that end up in the second best, where their net debt is less than it was before because they didn't borrow more, but they didn't pay off the existing debt with this, with this money. And we are going to, I'm gonna show you towards the end, the different potential explanations that we explore. Um, in, in particular, one thing that we know is that the saving decisions end up being uncorrelated with the probability of rolling over credit card debt. That is, they end up being uncorrelated with the probability of paying credit card interest. And they are also uncorrelated with credit card interest rates themselves. So your interest rates, even though it is not randomly assigned, so that needs to be interpreted with caution, no? Inter the interest rate that these individuals have on their credit card turns out to be uncorrelated with your response to the saving nudge. I have a quick question. Yes. The, so I feel like there's going to be a large group of people who they're receiving these nudges. They're not in this high, you know, they're not predicted to respond to the nudge the way that you're identifying, which is increasing their savings. But maybe by giving them nudges, they are going to start paying down their debt so they can start increasing their savings. Uh, so how do they, I mean, because that's like a different type of person who has debt and then increases their savings even while they have debt. But we're not really looking at, at those people and like evaluating the total effect of this nudge on the people for whom it actually, you're, you could actually be fixing this puzzle, which is that they're holding debt and they're not paying it down. So why, how do, should we think about those people in terms of your findings? And, and are you gonna interpret anything related to those people? Because I could see targeting, you know, you could just as easily target the effect of the nudge not on their savings behavior, but on their, their likelihood of paying down credit, right? So why don't you do that? Or you know, are you gonna be able to say anything about that? Yes, so first, um, we, so first kind of like, why don't we do that? Maybe let me start by that, no? Um, <clears throat> the motivating question, it's kind of like the policy question of whether saving non-just are financed with debt. No, and that is the how we center the analysis, and we think that to address this question, we want to focus on individuals that respond the most to the saving nudge and see whether or not they are paying. In terms of debt. saving, in terms of saving, mm -hmm. but you could just as easily be responding to the saving nudge in terms of paying down your debt, right? Because that would be the that would be the rational thing to do in terms of your response to the nudge, right? Is to I do want to save more. You are you're raising the salience of savings to me. I just happen to be holding this debt. So let me pay down this debt. So to me, that's the person who is responding more or j responding just as much 
to the nudge as people who are who are saving more, right? So basically, you're saying we should be focusing on the ones that are more likely to pay off their credit cards as a result of the notch. Let me show you the messages that we okay. use to see if, you, if, if we think that could be kind of like a natural response. Um, what we can tell you is that we don't find any action in this group or that has to do with kind of like changes in repayment decisions. Having said that, yes, there can be another group that um that is interpreting these messages that way we have not looked into that but we could potentially do that yes okay, okay. okay. um so this is the saving decisions and correlated with the probability of rolling over credit card debt and credit card interests and i just want to speak a little bit about um we think history uh, explanations based on mental accounting no but so let me give you more detail on the experimental design as I mentioned, we have these 3 million clients, a bit over 10% of them were assigned to a control group in which no one received any communication related to savings. They reminded individuals receive um, different messages uh, encouraging them to save. The intervention lasted seven weeks and the encouragements were sent via SMS and on the ATM screens, but just the ATM screens that happen after they make before they leave the ATM. It didn't happen before they make, sorry, the, the ATM screens messages happen after they finish all the transactions in the ATM, not before. So it's more like just informative. It is not influencing how much you are going to um, withdraw at that moment. The messages, as we have seven different messages. These were messages that were used by this partner bank previously in different A-B tests with different populations. And um, these messages do not pin down one particular psychology, but they, um, but they just, in, in, instead they just leverage different, a combination of multiple psychologies to encourage people to save. Um, for example, these congratulations, your average balance over the last 12 months has been great, kind of like appealing to a self image and, um, Join customers your age, who already save 10% of more of their income, appealing to some peer effect if you want. No. Um, these messages included in some cases a personalized amount, 10% of your income. We observe their income because, as I'm going to show you, these are payroll accounts. And uh, we know what 10% of that is. So we are able to personalize that number. Because of that, there may be some anchoring going on as well, no? But kind of like the main point is that uh, because these messages are a combination of different psychologies and more importantly, because what we care about is that uh, to be able to precisely estimate a potential null effect on credit card debt, because of that, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna pull all messages into one single treatment variable that takes the value of one if you receive any of these messages and zero otherwise. And again, the decision is because we want to have the most statistical power to study the treatment effect on credit card debt. Oh, Lina. Yes. Um, can you say something about how this goes together with other type of messages outside of your experimental design? Because, I mean, it sounds like this was um related to to holidays where you typically get a lot of like other messages as well around um, financial products yes so um we know that so this part was in partnership with the group inside the bank focusing on debit cards and checking accounts so they did not receive anything else related to debit card and checking accounts. They very likely receive additional information across different channels, be it email, SMS, push notifications for other products. But that would have happened both to treatment and control group. So it would needs, it's important for how to interpret the results, but at the very least, well, it doesn't bias a result, no? So this is just another, a few other examples of the messages. There was a total of seven. This is one that we are gonna pay a little bit of attention. No, that in Banorte, which is this partner bank, you have the safest money box and um, increase your balances by a particular amount. Good, so uh, who are the people that we look at? No, uh, as I mentioned, we have all these individuals. They have a monthly income of around 13,000 pesos, which is just around 1,300, US dollars, PPP, um, they, um, among these individuals, we focus on 
we pay particular attention to those who have a credit card. So one important thing to know, even though a lot of our analysis is going to be focused on individuals who have a credit card, we are going to use information on everyone to identify the ones that are more likely to respond. So without these guys, these additional, say 2.9, uh, 2.7 no? a million people who don't have a credit card, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So even though we focus on those who have a credit card, we use information for the, or from the full 3 million people. And how, how do these people who have a credit card look? So they have, a slight, they have a bit larger income, no? They have substantial credit limit available as per usual credit limit is gonna be very skewed. Um, so the median credit limit, we can look at this around 40,000, a pesos, which is forty hundred no uh, dollars, and um, so these are the individuals that are going to be uh, the center of our analysis. It's important to know that they have available credit limit, and I'm going to do some sample splits with them as well. Because if you are not saving, it could as well be because you don't have any credit limit available. We are going to rule that out. Yes. Um, in terms of covariate balance, um, we, we see that randomization indeed work. We don't have um, significant differences in the main variables that we look at. And I want to take just a second to talk about the experimental pool. We take a random sample from the universe of this, uh, of, of this, this, the clients of this bank, imposing only three constraints. First, to have a valid payroll account with Banorte. What is a payroll account? It's an account in which individuals receive their payroll. That actually gives us a pretty good measure of their income. They kept average daily balances of at least 50 Mexican pesos. That is very little. That is around um, $5 PPP, right? And why do we take such a minimal constraint, that's, that's what I'm gonna show you. And we use valid at cell phone and we require a valid cell phone number, no? So because experimental pool was selected with minimal constraint, that is why we can actually study treatment effect heterogeneity in a successful way. Why? Because many times you say, oh, run the experiment only on people who are sufficiently active. By running the experiment only on people that are sufficiently active, you are imposing a constraint into who do you think that is going to respond to the treatment. And by doing that, you end up with a pool that is very homogeneous. And when you do that, the method to study treatment effect heterogeneity many times is not able to pick up treatment effect heterogeneity. So we think that the fact that we selected the pool with minimal assumption is a feature of the design that's particularly well suited to study treatment effect heterogeneity. Instead of imposing our own priors of who do you think the treatment is going to work on, we're actually going to let the data speak and kind of like optimally identify what is the group for whom the treatment work. So let me show you what the aggregate results of the intervention are. So first, without looking at the top quartile, we have the full 3 million people, treatment and control. So what are the treatment effects? The treatment effects on average are really small. I don't think this is surprising, partly because of what I just told you, right? This is a population that was selected with minimal assumptions. And, uh, but even among this group, if we look at individuals who have a credit card, these two columns over here are individuals who have a credit card, we can see what is the treatment effect of the intervention and there is a 1.4% increase that is not accompanied by increases in credit card debt. So this is where a lot of studies would stop, or maybe they would look at some heterogeneity based on experimental strata that I'm also going to do as well and tell you that there's really not that more action there. But what we're going to do is that what if the, is this it, or is this the average of some people that don't respond and some people that respond a lot? We're going to find evidence that that is the case. This small effect is the average of some individuals that don't respond and some individuals that respond strongly to the treatment. So we implement this causal forest that I described earlier. And as I mentioned, um, this, of course, this, these methods are growing in popularity, but we use them in a method that no, no, not a lot of people have used, in, in a way that not a lot of people have used them before. Because we're not just comparing the characteristics of people that save a lot and people that don't save a lot, but because we have such a large sample size, we can zoom in 
and look at individuals that respond the most and say a, a few interesting things about them. So we have this distribution of predicted treatment effects. Again, remember that we have one prediction for each individual in the treatment group and for each individual in the control group. So we can actually plot this distribution. And so, and we're gonna focus on the ones that are responding the most to the treatment. But we're talking about predictions, so it's important to know if these are good predictions or not. So there are two features that we care about whether this is a good prediction or not. First of all, this could as well be just noise. This could be just noise and there maybe there is no heterogeneity at all and we are just picking up a distribution around the average effect that I showed you earlier with some noise around it. So to rule out that possibility, we implement the calibration test that Victor Chernoshokov and other co-authors uh, have formalized that basically tells you, is this noise or is this actually informative of treatment effects? And we find that it is informative on treatment effects. And there's a very intuitive way to see that, which is if this is, if this is noise and I split individuals into quartiles of predicted treatment effects, I'm not gonna get a sorting of actual treatment effects. There's a distinction between the predicted treatment effect that comes out of this exercise and the actual treatment effect. If I give you people in the treatment group and people in the control group, you can calculate the treatment effect for that group, right? And that's what we're going to do. And we see that this, act, this thing actually works well and we can, if we use this um, ordinal property of, of these predictions, we see that we are identifying basically two groups. So out of these 3 million people selected with minimal uh, filters, with minimal constraints, we find that there are basically two groups, a large group of people that just don't respond to the treatment and a group that has a strong response to the treatment. No? So what did we do here? I took these, these predictions over here. I used them as a score. I split people into quartiles. And for each quartile, I have, I have literally observations. Some are in the treatment group, some are in the control group. So I can calculate the treatment effect. And we see that the treatment effect is not significant for a lot of them, and it is significant for some of them. And these guys, I can further split them into quintiles, no? And then I see that these guys, actually, there is a group that has a strong response to the treatment. Sorry, this effect is on checking account balance? Oh, That's correct. Sorry, I thought this meant checking as in uh, looking at your account balance. But this is your oh, checking no. account balance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the checking account balances. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 they, yeah. They, they, they are savings variable, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I, I had not realized that. No, yeah, yeah, because I mean, it's a relevant I, outcome too, like for attention. Yeah, so yeah just, maybe yeah. I can type in here, no? Checking, hyper no, no, account. Yeah. Hey, that, that, that's a good point. It's not logging into anything, no? Um, obviously, we confirm that these are actually different with appropriate uh, yeah, standard errors and everything, no? But um, really, the center of our analysis is that, okay, let's focus, sorry on individuals that respond the most and who have a credit card. And that's what I have here, no? Results of saving and borrowing on individuals in the top quartile of predicted treatment effect who have a credit card. And these are the numbers that are alluded earlier, no? We have then on checking account balances, there is a 6% increase. There is a 6% increase in savings. And we measure borrowing in many different ways, intensive and extensive margin. And across the board, we don't have any evidence that there is an increase in savings. Indeed, most cases, there's a there's in most cases, there's a negative coefficient that's not significant, no? And uh, this is true, both if we take at all individuals who have a credit card, but also if we take at individuals who have a credit card and we're paying credit card interest at baseline. And one variable that's particularly useful for these guys is that we look at credit card payments in the next period, no? It's like if you have these payments, when you let the interest accrue for your consumption during the intervention, are you paying more on your credit card? And we find that these increases in savings are not used to pay off existing debt. 
So I have a quick question. The, yes. um, the uh, related to the method, because <clears throat> I don't understand exactly everything. So you, you're, we're looking at the people that responded to the most and we're comparing treatment and control. Um, are they, by the way that you did it, so are they, the people who respond to nudges that have credit, so this group that we're looking at here, they're still balanced on all of the variables, right? Good. That is an excellent question. So let me address it in two ways. First, um, there's a distinction between a predicted treatment effect and a treatment effect. The predicted treatment effect is defined even for individuals in the control group that did not receive the nudge and it is based exclusively on your observable characteristics. Um, in general, these things are balanced after, even after what? Because the covariance are balanced before the experiment. You see what I'm saying? If I am filtering on covariance, I am going to have covariate balance um, if I impose a filter on covariates during the intervention. That's the first kind of like way to think about it. Having said that, to improve precision, we can do this with a standard ITT or we can do it with an AIPW method. It's a, a, a augmented inverse probability weighted method that basically any discrepancies in between covariates are gonna be controlled for in, in the denominator of this uh, of this estimator. So our results are robust if you do the standard ITT or if you do the AIPW, which is the method that, um, that addresses any potential lack of balance that would happen only by chance. But the thing I want to emphasize is that there's not a systematic imbalance. It would be only the imbalance that could happen by chance when you impose filters on the covariate space as measured at baseline. Is that because these variables are used in the prediction or no? What? So Sorry, the, the credit card, like the, these outcome variables at baseline, these are used in the prediction of whether they're in the top quartile or not? At baseline, yes, but okay. not, uh, obviously these ones here, the dependent variable is during the observation period. Right, right, right. Of the observation period is used in the prediction. Right, right, but at baseline, okay. The, the, the sample sort of restriction that we're using here is it's, if there's any imbalance be. in the baseline outcome of these outcomes, you're saying that that's due to chance when we restrict the sample to those that are likely to respond most to the, to the treatment. Is that right? Um, so mm, not exactly sure, but let me give you another example. No? Suppose that I only have two variables no? that are say gender and income measured at baseline. No? And at the most basic level, imagine that the algorithm identify high income woman as being restrictive, as being responsive to the treatment. So that means that I am going to choose high income woman to be in the top quartile, right? But there's gonna be the same fraction of high income woman in the treatment and in the control group because there was balance in income and gender at baseline because it was randomly assigned. So even if I am not using anything on the outcome variables at baseline, just the fact that this is built just out of the covariates and that the treatment was randomly assigned so there is balance in the covariates, that is what allows me to bring this in, um, to maintain balance, even in the top quartile of the distribution. Okay. Does Thanks. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, Bernie, because I'm also not super sure if I understand the design or like the, the analysis, analytical choices here. Like, yes. Why would you prefer to restrict your sample to like those 126,000 people instead of just working with interaction terms. Like so I did look at them. everyone, no, right here. So this is everyone who has a credit card and I, I will look at them. And I think this is important because it's on average, no, what, it, what happened to people that have a credit card. Mm -hmm. But we think that um, even among them, this question, if I tell you that you increase your savings by 1.4%, and there's no increases in borrowing, that seems a bit less powerful than if I tell you, you increase your savings by a lot and nevertheless you didn't increase your borrowing. So just kind of like to be clear, mm -hmm. we think that the spillover question is particularly relevant 
for people that respond strongly to the treatment. But this statement that I just made is econometrically complex because I cannot mm -hmm. just pick and choose who responded strongly to the treatment because that would be subject to a lot of bias. No? Right. So I go around this other method to figure out without being subject to this overfitting bias, who would have a large response to the treatment based on your observable characteristics. And it's, it's the people that end up in being that quartile, it's these people, right? And turns out that indeed they have a large response in savings, but that they do not have, even them who have a large response in savings that are a population that is of particular interest for us, even them don't increase their borrowing as a result of the treatment. And this is pulled over all time periods. So like, could this just be kind of like a timing effect in the sense like, um, I pay back first and then I, you know, like, and then I save and then I... Um, and then I use the savings to pay off the debt. Excellent question, no? Because, so this is during the intervention, all these uh, balances and interest, pay, interest charges and borrowing measures. But this measure right here is precisely the next period, no? It's like, I use my credit card, I increase my savings, but when my credit card bill, maybe I use my credit card only to accumulate rewards, right? Because I'm a convenience user, so I'm just gonna be um, using my credit card to accumulate rewards. And that is why I have all these savings here, no? So what we measure in this last column is whether you use those savings to pay off your debt, and we find that that is not the case. So kind of like timing wise, these are during the intervention and six, column six here, it's whether you pay off the balances that were accrued during the intervention. And those balances come on the next billing cycle. Okay. So you're basically saying the nudges are gonna change how I think about saving, but they're not, affecting my consumption smoothing pattern. I'm still gonna use my credit card to increase my income. I'm, I'm, let, me, let me get to that. I'm gonna talk about yeah. spending in a second, no? But kind of like to Jared earlier question, the one thing that we're not looking at is just like a, a different evaluation. It's like, did people interpret these messages as I should be paying off my debt, no? And maybe there are some that did that. We are not, that is, that is one question that we are not, uh, we have not looked at. No, that's, that's the one that we haven't. Um, good, and I have different um, a robustness here, no, by message, correlations with interest rate, weekly utilization, no, because someone may say maybe they are not increasing their debt because they are already maxing out on their credit card. That, that doesn't seem to be the case either. An important thing as well is that um, we, so some of these variables we have, the main ones is the credit card balances with the bank, no? And the credit card interest with the bank because those are measures of rollover debt. But we also include credit card balances from the credit bureau, right? And just to make sure that it's not something that we're missing from outside, no? Uh, maybe we're not seeing anything with this bank, but there's something else going on after um, we don't find, even though balances, as I mentioned, is not necessarily the best measure to study this question. We, we look at that, we don't find any evidence either. But um, just to kind of like zero in on that, with credit bureau data, we get the full picture of the credit portfolio of households, but not of the assets, right? There is not a credit bureau for checking accounts. I cannot know what's the checking account balance that you have in other, in other banks. So to address that question and make sure that we're not missing a lot of information there, we focus on client on clients for which we think that Banorte is the main bank. What do we think by main bank? I started mentioning that these are all payroll clients. So these people are receiving their paychecks at Banorte. So that's an important feature. But I can also see if you have credits outside of Banorte. So we approximate main bank by getting your payroll here and not having any credit outside of Banorte. 
How do we know that? Well, because we have credit bureau data. I can see if you have credits outside of Banorte or not. And if you don't have a credit outside of Banorte, that is our approximation for seeing if you have accounts outside of Banorte. And we find that the results are really robust. No, basically there's a large increase in savings that is not accompanied by increases in borrowing. Now to Julia, uh, so, Yes, to Julia's question, no, uh, what is happening in terms of spending, no? So what we see first, first of all, we look at deposits and we look at ATM withdrawals and spending with credit and debit card. Because the question is, if you are not increasing your debt, where is the money coming from? So one possibility is that maybe you are increasing your labor supply and you're actually getting more money into your account and that is where the savings came from. We don't find any evidence that that is the case. But maybe you are actually spending less. So Julia, you do end up spending less and they end up, we measure these decreases in spending by, um, less ATM withdrawals and less spending with credit and debit card. So basically what people are doing on the scene these messages is that they are taking less money out of their accounts. And one may say, if we were looking only at ATM withdrawals, maybe I take him less money out, but this was money that I have under the mattress anyway. So really my spending didn't change. Well, we see a similar pattern with credit and debit cards as well, in which that argument would be harder to make. No, People are literally swiping less their credit and debit cards. I have one more question. Like maybe this is very stupid, but how do you actually pay back your credit card debt? Good. Like, is that easy or automatic? Yes, no, good. So you can do it going to a branch. Mm -hmm. And you would use, so you need to use the literally you go, you go to a branch, no, after you receive your monthly statement, or you can do it from your online banking account. Those are the two dominant options. So but you, you would do need have to make, to make a transfer, like you do have to take costly action to actually reduce your credit, um, credit debt, whereas like increasing spending is just like using it less. Is that right? I say I am. So like to pay back my credit card debt, I do have to have, like, I have a costly action. Like I either have to figure out my online banking or I have to go to a bank branch. Um, whereas if I want to increase my savings, I just, you know, like use my card less. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think that's okay. an important distinction. No, one is kind of like passive, no? And one mm -hmm. involves a cost. I do want to emphasize maybe a distinction between the intensive and extensive margin of credit card repayment that we have, have we looked at it that I don't think we have looked at, no? Which is like, you're talking about this costly action that is on the extensive uh, on the extensive margin. If I was not paying my credit card and now I'm going to pay it. But it could as well be that there's no effect on the extensive margin and everything is on the intensive margin. It's about how much do I pay? Um, we have not looked into that. I think we can look into that specifically because it relates to an earlier question that came up, no? Which is kind of like, consequences of lack of payment and so on. We have not looked at whether this had any impact on the probability of making a payment at all, no? On the probability mm -hmm. of incurring a late payment fee or on the probability of missing a payment, if you want. And I think we can certainly look into that. No? Um, this is the calibration test that I show you for heterogeneity in borrowing, no? Um, so I, I notice I have only five minutes left. So let me just kind of like tell you what we have here. Um, so just to kind of like why what we're doing is different from previous application of causal forest. Because what people have used the causal forest for is to say, is there heterogeneity or not? And if there is heterogeneity, what are the characteristics of people that respond and the characteristics of people that don't respond? What we're doing is qualitatively different because we really need to be able to flag individuals, as I told you earlier, and to zoom in to these individuals who have a, a large predicted response to the treatment. And we can do that because we're power enough, no? because we're focusing on less than 25% of our original sample. As I mentioned, we use information of the entire group 
to be able to focus on them. But the tables that I show you are for this smaller group. And if you start with 3,000 observations, yes, you can run a causal forest to test for treatment effect heterogeneity, but you are not, not going to be able to do this population analysis that we do. In the paper, we have a comparison of what happens if instead of causal forest, I just look at heterogeneity by experimental strata, which is kind of like the standard way to do things. And what happens is that we don't find a lot of action. So kind of like, what do I mean by that? Kind of like, if I, the experimental strata ultimately are based on our priors, no? What are the ex ante characteristics that I wanna look at? And maybe what are the groups that ex ante, I think are gonna have the largest response to the treatment. And we look at several things, baseline checking account balances, baseline of income, uh, age, ATM withdrawals, transactionality, do you, uh, and do you have greater, we look at several, because we have large sample size, we can stratify over a number of things, and we don't find a lot of action. So using the causal forest really bought us a lot of predictive power over what we could do just with experimental strata. We also describe the problem of overfitting that would arise with experimental strata. Um, if we were just picking and choosing all the potential combinations to identify the groups with the largest response to the treatment in the paper, we have that discussion. Instead of that, I'm just gonna briefly focus on the credit card debt puzzle. Um, so just to give you a sense in our sample, the average credit card interest is 35%. And this checking accounts pays zero, zero percent. Um, but 13 percent of individuals who pay credit card interest have more than 50 percent of their income over the previous six months of the intervention in their checking account. And that is the minimum balance over the last six months. So these individuals throughout the previous six months, they always had at least 50 percent of their income in the checking account, and they are nevertheless paying credit card interest. And this phenomenon is also common in the US, no, it has been widely documented, this co-holding, and, um, and it is expensive for households in the US as well. And there are several explanations. Some explanations are based on liquidity management. The idea is that cash is not the same as negative debt, because there are some transactions in the field's explanation that I can only do with cash. For example, I cannot, in the USA, I cannot pay my rent with a credit card. I need to pay my rent or my mortgage with, a, with cash, right? Um, obviously in developing and middle income countries, even more. There are a lot of transactions that I have to make with cash for which I cannot uh, I cannot use my credit card, so it's important. That's an explanation. Um, mental accounting is another explanation. So instead of going over each with detail, we are just going to interpret our findings through the lenses of these theories. And um, so we, we find that um, individuals are not, they don't seem to be these individuals in the top quartile, maybe that would be the qualification I would add now. These individuals in the top quartile are not optimizing the decrease in net savings. They are, they are responding to the treatment, but not in the most efficient way. Is it optimal liquidity management or mental accounting? Well, we provide a few explanations, no? Um, that for which we think it's mental accounting. I think the most interesting ones is that savings are uncorrelated with credit card interest and with the probability of carrying credit card, credit, of carrying credit card interest, no? With your interest rate or the probability of paying your interest rates. And just to conclude, to the best of our knowledge, there is only one study that looks at the potential relation between saving notches and credit outcomes. And that study uses credit bureau data. And as I told you, credit bureau data does not capture credit card interest and doesn't capture spending. We find that uh, saving notches are not financed with new debt. There are no increases in debt. There are increases, net in, increases in net savings but not always in the most efficient way. Some individuals, this increase in net savings is second best because they would be better off paying off existing debt. 
And we think there's some suggestive evidence that this may be happening in, um, because individual process saving and borrowing decisions in different mental accounts. So that is what I have and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Paulina. Uh, so uh, I don't know if, if there are uh, any other questions or, or comments. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Paulina, for the, the, the great discussion and presentation. Uh, and, and well, uh, we are going to have a, a, a seminar on uh, next Friday. Uh, we are going to have uh, Marco Gonzalo Navarro from UC Berkeley. So thank you, everybody, for, for being here today. And well, we hope to have you uh, for the next seminar. And thank you so much again, Paulina. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone.